Okay, everyone, it's time for us to go ahead and get started on lecture five. Um, so as far as the lectures go, I'm trying to increase the amount that we do a little bit with regards to the fact that when I'm actually in the classroom, I found that lectures take a lot longer, um, which, by the way, is more fun. But when I'm not, I'm just recording them, I can cover more material. And since you all are paying a fortune for this education, as you all know, um, the more material I can cover, the more ready you'll be for 172 or whatever um, additional bio courses you guys are going to take. So for the first little while, anyway, we're going to be as much as I can. I'm going to be adding, um, you know, two lectures here and there because I want us to make sure we cover everything we need to. Okay, so today we're just going to quickly in this particular lecture review independent assortment and dihybrid crosses. We'll also talk about things that violate Mendel's rules. Okay, so co-dominance and incomplete dominance. We'll talk about when multiple alleles impact a particular trait as well as all sorts of other good stuff and maternal inheritance. And if you haven't, um, come on guys, you at least get a laugh at the cartoon because it's funny. <laughs> Yeah, it's a geeky biology joke, but it's still funny. <laughs> okay, so let's go through our first application question. Given what we talked about last time, what principle is being illustrated in this cell? Take a moment, pause lecture, okay, and then genuinely look through this and make your decision. In case you happen to be curious, it's when the alleles are separating, in which case it is B, the law of segregation. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, let me know. Okay, so once again, another question for application. Take a minute, okay? Pause lecture. Be honest with yourself and address this question. All right, hopefully you guys chose A, okay? Because it's a 50-50 shot that they line up with big A's and big B's on the same side, but it's a 50-50 shot that it goes the other way as well, okay? Okay, so yet another application question. Take a moment, read through this. Just a reminder that non-disjunction means that your chromosomes don't separate, okay? So if the blue chromosomes don't separate during meiosis one, what law will be violated? Take a moment, pause lecture, choose your answer. Which law is that of, of splitting? That would be law of segregation. Therefore, the answer is B. I hope that makes sense. And once again, if not, let me know. Okay, let's have a few more application questions. Okay, so I want us to think about how many gametes can you get if you have a certain genotype? Okay, because it's the gametes that you get that are going to make a difference with regards to the cross, of course, and the offspring. So let's talk about this. We have an individual, and you know, again, I told you I love genetics practice problems. Once again, we're doing genetics practice problems. <laughs> Sorry, I want you guys to have this down solid, okay? You have an individual who is heterozygous for two separate alleles, big T, little t, big R, little r. Now ask yourself, what would homozygous look like? Well, it was homozygous for big T's or homozygous for R's. Homozygous means it's the same, right? Okay, heterozygous means big little. In this case, it's a big little, big little individual, okay? And the question is, how many unique gamete types exist? Well, the thing to remember with this is if you're figuring out the gametes, then they have half the amount of genetic information, okay? So there are two genes here. There's a T gene and an R gene, okay? Because you're looking at two different traits. So what you have to do, first off, do not read the answers yet. Answer this first, and then you go find the choices that fit, okay? So you have an individual that's heterozygous for both, big T, little t, big R, little r. And it wants to know how many unique gametes exist for that one. Okay, so you have to pair up every combination of T and R. Okay, so my suggestion to you, start with the big and then move to the little. Okay, so one possibility is big T, big R. Write that down. Another possibility is big T, little r. Write that down. And always do it in this order, guys, because it makes life so much easier when you have a pattern down. The next possible gamete is little T, big R. Okay, and the last possible gamete is little t, little r. So a lot of problems students have with this is they know it's supposed to be half of the amount of genetic information, but they forget that it's one of each. Don't forget that. It's one t and one r, and then you just work through all the different possible combinations. Okay, so that tells us what? How many do we have? We have four, which eliminates a, b, and d. Okay. Now, for a big little t, little t, little r, little r, that's the second individual, how many unique gametes types exists, okay? 
Still do every possible combination, but the thing is, is these are all the same. Okay, so it's just going to be a little t and just going to be a little r. So there's only one. Therefore, flip to the next slide, c should be your correct answer. Okay? Oh, look, a happy face. Write this down. All right? So always read the questions. And remember, in science, it's the details. Okay? In which case, um, not going to try and trick you, but you got to be able to apply this. But remember, it's all about the questions, all about the details. So when you have a question, we don't panic. We read the question carefully and figure out what it's going to ask. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so the next question, which of the following genotypes would you not expect to find among the offspring if, in fact, this is your cross? All right, so first thing we do is we don't panic. Second thing we do is think through, okay, how do I address this question? Well, in this example, honestly, I would say use a Punnett square. Okay, because a Punnett square will show you all the different possibilities that do exist, and then from that you can eliminate the ones that you see and then focus on the one that does not exist. By the way, you see not. This is once again, if, if it asks what would you expect versus what would you not expect. You've got to read the details. Okay, don't just gloss over. Make sure you know what the question is asking. Okay, so let's draw out our Punnett square. Okay, so and with our Punnett square, um, your first thing you're going to do is list all the possible gametes that you have. And remember, you have big T, little t, big R, little r, cross with little t, little t, little r, little r. Okay, so the first thing is the gametes for each one of those. And we said this before, for the gametes, it's going to be half the amount of DNA and all the possible combinations. And when we're talking combinations, we're talking T and R. Okay, so if you look at the four boxes across the top, we've got big T and big R. That should make sense, big and big. Then we have big T and little r. Remember I said do the bigs first. Then we have little t and big r. And then we have little t and little r. Okay? So those are all the possible gametes of that particular individual. Make sure that this makes sense. If it doesn't, there's a problem. Okay? Because this kind of is the easy stuff. If it doesn't make sense, come find me. <laughs> well, let's chat. Okay, we can talk over Zoom or something like that. Don't forget, by the way, guys, there's an entire world of online resources out there that I wish I had had when I was your age, okay? So don't be afraid to use them. There's a lot of good stuff out there. And I'm always happy to help you. You all know this. This is my job, and I love chatting with you. However, sometimes it helps to hear something in a different way from someone else because sometimes that's when things click. Okay, so the more ways that you hear something, the more likely you are to remember it, okay, and then have things actually work. Now, let's talk about the next one. Little t, little t, little r, little r, okay, so that's our individual where the different gametes coming from that one. Well, the only, thing can, the only thing it can be is little t and little r, okay? So you draw out your Punnett square, you actually look through those, those possibilities, and of course the one where it's not actually possible is going to be e. Everybody else is there, but E is not. And that should make sense because you're not going to get a big R, big R out of this cross. Okay. Now, another way to solve this, if you wanted to, is you could do many Punnett squares and solve for the T's separately and the R's separately. Okay. And you can see what are the different possibilities from that. I will leave it up to you. Okay. To figure out how you want to do it best. Do whatever makes the most sense for you. Okay, so let's go through another example here. I want you to take a moment and read through this question. So stop right now, stop the lecture, and read through the question. Now we're going to work through this together, but don't pick an answer yet because I want us to have a good review of the best way to address a problem like this, okay? So put me on pause, and then we'll come back to this. Okay, so if you're going to tackle this problem, the first thing you see is true breeding. Remember when we said true breeding, that means it's homozygous, okay? So... You, the first thing you do when you see a problem like this is you write down what you know. Okay, so true breeding mice with brown fur and long tails are crossed to true breeding, in other words, homozygous mice with yellow fur and short tails. Okay, all of the F1 mice had brown fur and long tails. This right now is important and you need to write this down. Okay, so first off, you have to decide what letters you're going to use for what. My suggestion to you is to write B for the fur color because B is brown and brown is dominant. You know this because all the F1 mice are brown and they're heterozygous. Okay, so in that first cross you have true breeding mice. So you have a big B, big B. Okay, and it's crossed to a yellow fur. So little B, little B. Okay, so big B, big B, leave a space for the second allele and then cross with a little B, little B. Okay, now let's tackle that second allele. We have tails. Okay, and we have long tails and short tails. Well, which one's dominant? 
Well, all, met, all F1 mice had long tails, therefore long tails is dominant. So I would use a capital L, okay? And what I even do on the side is I'll write a big B is brown fur, and I'll say that's dominant to little b, which is yellow fur. The more stuff you write down, the less likely you are to mess it up in your head. And I'm telling you from personal experience, <laughs> i.e., I had to write this down, okay? So this is what I want you to do too, all right? Now, so big B is going to be brown fur, and little b, little b is going to be yellow fur. Write that down. Let's deal with the tails. Big L is going to be long tails, okay? And then little l, little l is going to be short tails. You should write that down too, okay? So let's write out the cross that you had to begin with. So you had big B, big B, big L, big L, and then a cross with little b, little b, little l, little l, okay? Those are your parents, so put a P somewhere around there because that's your parent, all right? Then go to your F1. That's write F1 down beneath that. And we know that they're heterozygous, so we got big B, little b, okay, big L, little l. Those are all of the F1 mice. Now, you're crossing an F1 mouse with another F1 mouse. And yes, it sounds gross, mice don't care. Okay, so um, you're crossing a big B, little b, big L, little l with another big B, little b, big L, little l. Okay, so that should be your cross. Now, what you want to do is figure out what fraction of the offspring would you expect to have the same genotype as the F1 mice. So there's a question mark, and you want to know about the F1s. Well, remember that it wants to know how many individuals are going to be big B, little b, big L, little l. Write that down too, and write the question mark out in front of it. Now, when we solve for this, by the way, I'm telling you right now, we're using probability. <laughs> it's just so much easier. We'll work through the pen and square so you can see that too. Okay, but what I want you to do, whenever you see more than one gene, use probability. It's just so much easier. All right, guys, so we know that both parents are big B, little b, big L, little l. Wants to know what fraction of their offspring are going to be big B, little b, big L, little l. Now we're going to use probability, okay? And so you have to split everything up individually. So the probability of getting a big B mo from mom is going to be, what do you think? And then what's the probability of getting a little b from dad? Consider the gametes. All right, then the probability of getting a big b from dad. And then the probability of getting little b from mom. Okay, then what I want you to think about is you could have the first possibility, big b from mom, little b from dad, or, in other words, you add big b from dad, little b from mom. So figure out those individually, add the two together, and that's the probability of big B, little b. All right, then what I want you to do is the same thing for the L's, okay? Once you work that out, then you're, going to, you're asking the question of big B, little b, and big L, little l. So once again, you, when you use add, you multiply, okay? So take a moment, work through this, make sure it makes sense. Okay, oh look, a smiley face. Hopefully this is what you found. Probability of big B from mom is a half. Probability of a little B from dad is a half. Probability of a big B from dad is a half. Probability of a little B from mom is a half. Okay, probability of one and the other is going to be a half times a half, and you multiply. And it could be either the first one or the second choice, where it's, you know, as I said above. So you add those two together and you get a half, okay? Then you do the same thing for the else, and it's got to make sense because it's the exact same thing. Okay. Then what you do is you're going to put it together because you want to know the probability of the Bs and the probability of the Ls, which is a half times a half, which gives you a fourth. Now, I'm going to convert this to four sixteenths for a reason. Okay. So four sixteenths, we're going to show um, doing this exact same problem using a Punnett square. I promise you, the more probability you do, the less you're going to want to use Punnett squares, okay? Just give it some time and let it sink in, and then when you're ready, go to the next Punnett, go to the next one. We'll talk about a Punnett square and all the different things you got to do for that. <laughs> now, if you're going to try and use one big Punnett square, I will tell you you're going to have to have 16 squares for this, okay? Now, you technically, you know, technically you can do this, but remember, probability is a lot easier. So let's try the exact same problem using probability. So the first thing you got to do is write out all the different gamete combinations and keep your patterns the same, okay? So go to the above, look at your cross, two heterozygotes cross with, you know, each other. Figure out all the different gamete possibilities and then write that across the top and down the side.
Now if in fact you choose to do the Punnett square, this is what it should look like, okay? In which case, I want you to see a pattern. Big, 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 little, little, big, little, little, okay? Big B, big L, across the top and so forth, and also down the side. There's a, always keep it consistent and always do it the same because then you know to look for patterns. Once you've done this and you put together all the combinations, you count how many of those had the same genotypes as the parents. And just like we said, four out of 16, okay? Otherwise known as a fourth, which is what you found using the laws of probability. Now let's say that large Punnett squares aren't your thing, but let's also say that it's hard for you to visualize the probability completely yet, okay? There is actually a compromise, and this I'd be totally fine with. What you can do is split up your genes and look at them using individual Punnett squares. So we have two genes, two Punnett squares, okay? And what you do is you work out all the possibilities for each of the gene sets, and then, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna combine them in the end, okay? Try this on your own for right now. Pause lecture. Don't forget the rules. All right. And then flip to the next slide when you, you know, start us up again when you're ready. And then once you look at it, it'll probably make a whole bunch more sense. So when I was your age, <laughs> a billion <coughs> years ago, <laughs> as my family likes to remind me, um, <laughs> I will tell you, I wasn't all that mathematically minded. Okay. It's hard for me to visualize probabilities and so forth. Therefore, to be honest with you, if I was your age, I probably would have picked, picked this technique, okay? So you work out big B, little b, big B, little b, okay? Two out of four, otherwise known as a half, is the probability of getting big B, little b, um, because that's what the parents have, all right? Then work out the same for the L's. Big L, little l, cross with big L, little l, two of them are heterozygous, okay? And that's a half a, two fourths or half a probability of that. Now, in the final individual, the final genotype, it's B's and L's. Whenever you see and, you multiply, okay? So that gives you an answer of one-fourth or four out of 16. So all three of these ways work, and they give you the same thing. Don't do a pun and square with 16 of them. I'm too lazy for that. You guys don't want to do that, okay? If you're mathematically minded, go straight up probability. If you want something in between, my suggestion is go with the small pun and squares and then combine your data so you just have to multiply it at the end. However, it's up to you. Okay, so another word problem. Yay! <laughs> you guys can do this. I have complete faith in your capabilities, okay? So, this is one of those questions that you have to think through. It's an application question because we've not really talked about this yet. So in some ways it's kind of not fair, but in some ways it's totally fair because if you think through this, it should make sense, and it's not C, okay? So what I want you to do is read the question, think about what you feel the answer is, okay? Pause the slide, pause the lecture now, choose your answer, and then start us up again. Okay, so if you think through this, you have this mouse, you have brown fur and a long tail, but the idea is it could be big B, big B, big L, big L. It could be big B, little B, big L, little L. You have no idea what the genotype is. What type of cross will let you determine the genotype? Okay. Now, if you think about this, all right, I told you it's not C. Obviously, that's not the case. Um, however, B should make sense. And if you've been exposed to this early on, you know that this is called a test cross. Now the reason B actually works is that when you cross against a homozygous recessive, whatever the offspring show you, okay, whatever the offspring are shows you what the genotype was. For example, let's say you run your um, test cross and you cross it with a homozygous recessive and, um, you know, you look at the offspring and they're all brown fur and a long tail, okay? Well, if that happens, then that means they were big B, big B, big L, big L. That's how you know the genotype was. Make sure you can go back and think through this, okay? And it should make sense. If you work out the possibilities, and the, so the, what I would do is I would then work out all the different possibilities just once so this makes sense and kind of sits in your head, all right? And so you could also have them all brown fur, but then half of them long tail, half of them short tail. Well, it tells you it's big B, big L, big B, big L, little L, because it's half and half, okay? So again, work out the possibilities. Make sure it makes sense. Homozygous dominance is not going to tell you anything, and the reason is because everything then will be dominant, okay? Because that overrides everything, whereas homozygous recessive reveals what's truly there. All right, another cross, okay? 
and I want you to read through this. All right, pause lecture and then come up with the answer. So stop right now, pull out your slide and write down what you feel the answer is. All right, so there's multiple ways to do this. Okay, so the first way is to plug in the formula where it's two to the n. All right, and so the thing to consider is n is the number of heterozygotes because it's homozygotes and everybody's the same. So two to the nth, there's three genes, they're all three heterozygous, so it's two to the third, two times two times two, which is eight. The other thing you can do is work it out. And once again, stay consistent. Big B, big L, big R, big B, big L, little R, big B, but keep working through every single one, and you see that they're listed right there, okay? So let's say we alter this a bit. What if the parental genotype was as across the bottom? How would that be different? This one, you guys got to talk about and work on your own because this one's much easier than the one you just did. Okay, so calculate it with the formula I just said. All right, and then work it out longhand too, and it should be totally piece of cake. Okay, apparently I lied because I forgot I put the slide in there. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, so the par <laughs> parents genotype again, parents heterozygous for two of the three. Therefore, you got to modify the rule. It can still two to the n, but n is going to be the number of heterozygotes, okay? Because if it's homozygous, it's the same, and then it's going to be, you know, that no matter what. So if you work through this the old-fashioned way, okay, you can see big L, big B, oh, all the way through, okay? <laughs> or you can work with n as the number of heterozygotes, and it would be four. This should make sense. Okay, so let's put this whole, like, probability slash mini- Punnett squares using single genes to the test. Okay? Now, I want you to take a few minutes. You're going to go ahead and you've got the following cross. Big A, little A, big B, big B, big C, little C, big D, little D. Cross with a big A, little A, big B, little B, big C, little C, little D, little D. And it wants to know what is the expected frequency of the offspring with this particular genotype. So how many? The way to solve this is probability slash mini punnett squares cross big a little a with a big a little a of those how many do you get that are going to be little a little a okay right there you can eliminate two of your answers then go big b big b cross with a big b little b how what's the percentage of those that would be big b big b okay once again you're starting to zero in more on what your answer is going to be okay so you solve for each of these um, using little punnett squares for the individual genes and then remember at the end it's the the expected frequency of little a little a and big b big b and little c little c and little d little d you use and so you multiply if everything that went the way it's supposed to you should have picked c okay and again that should make sense so take each of those individual punnett squares do the crosses, figure out the probabilities, make sure it looks right. Everybody's combined at the end, so 1 out of 64. Imagine if you were trying to do this on your own and it was 2 to the nth and how many different square pun and squares you'd have to have. No, thank you. This is so much easier. Now, I'm hoping on your slides you're not having any issues with the lineup of the text and pictures. I'm sorry. Something happens every time I convert this in Adobe. The program I'm using, but we're going to focus on now is co-dominance and incomplete dominance, okay? Because these specifically violate Mendel's rules and not violate, but they don't follow Mendel's rules. And so we know that Mendel came up with this amazing, you know, study that basically kicked off the entire field of genetics. So if you didn't know that, you know that now. However, not everything follows his, the rules that he came up with, okay? And there are some exceptions. And so we're going to talk about those today. Okay, so what we've been talking about so far with our examples is known as complete dominance, okay, which means that the phenotype of the heterozygote is going to, in other words, what it looks like is going to look as the same as the homozygous dominant. That means that one completely covers the other, okay? But that's not the way everything works. You can also have what's known as incomplete dominance, where the heterozygote is kind of intermediate between the two. A great example, of course, are the flowers listed above. You see the white and the purple, but the heterozygote is, you know, in between to both. Okay? And then last but not least, we have an example of codominance. Now, in codominance, both genes, both alleles are expressed fully. Okay? So let's say one parent had stripes and the other parent had spots. The offspring would have both stripes and spots. All right? So let's dive into a little more depth of this. 
Now, one of the big contributions that Mendel made in his time was that he basically discovered blending inheritance did not work, and that's not how things operated. Okay, so back in the day, people used to think that children were always as perfect blend and intermediate to the parents. All right, and in some situations, yeah, that's the case, but in, in most situations, genes don't work that way. Okay, so an incomplete dominance is the exact same. It's not always blending, okay? And the question is, why is this not just blending inheritance? Well, let's think about this. When you're ready, go to the next slide. Okay, so why is it not blending inheritance? Well, if it was always blending inheritance and the children were always this perfect intermediate to the parents, eventually everything would look the same. Okay, everybody would look the same. All the heights would be the same. Everything would be the same, especially through hundreds of years of generations. Okay, um, the best way I can think of to show this is through an example of flowers because, yeah, I'm a botanist by heart and so plants are my favorite. So flip to the next slide. So if, in fact, this was always blending inheritance and you crossed a red with a white and got a pink, okay, the reason we know it's not blending is because if you crossed a pink with a pink, all of the offspring should be pink because they're just blended. But in fact, that is not the case at all. If you cross an F1, big A, little a, with another F1, big A, little a, you get the F2 that look at it like the F2 here. So you see red again and you see white again. So it's not blending, okay? Hopefully that makes sense because remember, if it was blending, everybody would be the same. This is not the case. Your red and your white appear again in your F2, which tells you that you got something else going on. Okay, so it's time to apply again, all right? And we've gone through a lot of different possibilities and a lot of different problems right now. You have everything you need to answer this question, okay? This is the type of question that is going to gear you up for genetics here at Michigan. So make sure that you can get to this level that this makes sense. All right? Definitely stop lecture. Take a moment. Read through this. Okay? Work through this. Make your choice. And then start lecture again. But please take the time to work through this to make sure that this makes sense, you got everything down pat, because you've got to know how to manipulate to the point of where you're applying like this question asks. Okay, so what's the first thing you do when you see a problem like this is we take a deep breath and we don't panic, okay? The second thing that you wanna do with this is you write down what you know, okay? First off, she has a cross between two true breeding parents. Once again, true breeding is homozygous. White flowers and thorns crossed with dark pink flowers and no thorns. Write out your cross. Then what I want you to do is write out what the F1 would look like, both phenotypically as well as genotypically. Well, they told you the answer what the F1. They have light pink flowers, but no thorns. Okay? Which tells you that flower color is incompletely dominant because, you know, it's in between the two parents. But thorns show complete dominance. Write that out to the side. Literally, it will help you think through this as you're trying to get to know this stuff. Okay? Then the question is, what plant should she cross her F1s with to get the highest number with the correct phenotype? Because remember, she wants light pink with no thorns. Okay? Then what I want you to do is think through, you know what the F1s are, okay, with regards to genotype. So who should she cross her plant with to get the most number of plants with the phenotype she's after? If you guys work through it properly, it should be B, okay? So again, work through the A, work through C, work through D and E, figure out why B is the case. All of this stuff takes time, okay? It takes time to learn to recognize this. It takes time to learn how to look for the patterns. So, you know, just check it. Just make sure you go through it and make sure you're comfortable with it. In case you need it, workspace for the last problem. All right, so the next slide is going to have an interactive video. My hope is that it loads automatically. If it doesn't, use the link that I'll provide you into the announcements to go watch that video now. Okay, so now we're going to talk about codominance. Remember, codominance is when you have both traits that are produced by the alleles and they're equally visible, okay? Horizontal stripes, vertical stripes, look at the little kid, he's got both. I thought it was really cute. Oh, come on, you gotta at least chuckle a little bit, okay? So we're gonna go through an example where codominance co fits perfectly, and that would be blood type. So one example of codominance with regards to um, blood type would be sickle cell anemia. 
you guys have probably heard of sickle cell anemia. So those who are afflicted with it have both, um, both have to be sickle cell. And people who have more recent origins to Africa tend to have this, and there's a really cool evolutionary reason why. And I'm going to try to remember that to put sort of like as a bonus towards the end of the lecture. But basically, people who have sickle cell anemia, in other words, they're expressing it, and they have both SS, it's really an awful disease to have. And so what happens is your blood cells will then, um, instead of being shaped round, where they can go through the capillaries super easy, they are shaped as sickle shaped, and then they get stuck. So imagine that basically you have these parts of your body and you've got these capillaries that are getting clogged with blood cells. It is so painful. It has to be so painful because then the tissue starts to die. How awful is that? Okay. With normal blood type, your cells are round and they will fit through the capillaries like they're supposed to. The reason this is a good example of codominance is because some of the cells, if you have, if you're heterozygous for this, will be normal and some will have sickle shape. Okay. And so, but both of them are expressed equally. Okay, so the reason that this again is codominance is A and S have different DNA sequences. They make proteins with different amino acid sequences. They fold into different shapes. And this is what produces the cells or the blood cells of different shapes. Okay, now from an evolutionary perspective, the reason that more people afflicted with this um, with regards to more recent Africa, I mean, everybody comes from Africa. We know this. Humans migrated out of Africa multiple times. And so, you know, that's the way it is. And it's interesting because those who have more recent links to Africa, whose ancestors came from there more recently, um, there's a high proportion of sickle cell anemia. And it turns out that the reason is those who are heterozygous for this don't come down with malaria as much. Okay. And so malaria is a very debilitating, horrible disease. It takes many lives. It's an awful, awful thing to have. Okay. If you're heterozygous though, you, your blood cells are not sickle cell shaped. A few of them are, but they're not bad. Okay. Not enough to clog the capillaries and your body's resistant to malaria, which is an evolutionary strategy. So if you're curious about this, go to Google, consider this a field trip, virtual field trip. Okay. Google the, you know, presence of malaria in Africa. Okay, and see if you can find a geographic map. And then Google the presence of sickle cell, you know, anemia in Africa. And you'll find that the maps overlap almost completely, which is pretty cool. If it turns out you can't find it, let me know. But this is a relatively famous teaching tool that people use, so I have a feeling you'll see both of them there. And this is why, though, that sickle cell anemia, because it's such a debilitating disease, this is why it hasn't been selected out thousands of years ago, because there is an advantage to being heterozygous. From an evolutionary perspective and a science perspective, that's so fascinating. But again, sickle cell is awful. So from a human perspective, it's terrible. <laughs> so sorry, the scientist in me kicks in and the evolutionary biologist does too and explains things that we may not normally realize, which is why I love science so much. All right, we're chugging right along and we're going to go with um, now talk about the concept of multiple alleles. By the way, I really hope you guys can see the heterozygotes, just allele and even ha 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 ha. Oh, come on, it's funny. Okay, so what I want us to start thinking about is get a little bit more broad than we have been. And I want us again apply things, okay? So in humans, each individual has only blank alleles for each gene. This should be super easy. We are diploid. Okay, and then each gamete, i.e. egg or sperm, has only how many alleles for each gene? Okay, take a moment, pause lecture, answer this. Now, if you work through this properly, we're diploid. Each individual has two alleles for each gene. Each gamete only has one. However, if you look at this from a population level, okay, ABO, within your population, you're going to have three different alleles. You can be A, you can be E, you can be B, you can be O. Okay, and in populations, you have those three alleles because the population is made up of, you know, X number of individuals, 20, 30, 40, something along those lines. Something else to consider, hemoglobin proteins, which are basically um, proteins that are what cause um, the binding of oxygen. There are 500 different alleles in the human population. 500, okay? So not every single, you know, city has every single... Um, you know, allele, it just depends where things are distributed and so forth. But what I want you to do is step back and look at things from a population level perspective. Yeah, we're diploid. We only have two. But if you have a population, then it's all the different, you know, who knows how many different possibilities are there. Okay, so the way blood type works is that A and B are glycoproteins, okay, which is sugar in a protein, and it's expressed on the surface of red blood cells. So, 
blood type A has glycoprotein A. Blood type B has glycoprotein B. And then O doesn't have either one. Okay, so what I want you to remember is that A and B are co-dominant to one another, which means if you have AB in a person, their blood type is expressed as AB. Okay, O though is recessive to A and it is also recessive to B. Write this down, okay? What this means is that there are four different phenotypes in a population. You can be A, you can be B, you can be AB, or you can be O. Okay, but there are six different genotypes likely in a population. Blood type A, you can be AA or AO. And by the way, O is expressed with a little i. Okay, if you're blood type B, you could be BB or BO. If you're blood type AB, you're only going to be AB. And if you're blood type O, you're only going to be II. And I would like you to start using those terminology just because it's good for you to get familiar with it now. So when you're taking those upper level genetics courses later on, you're like, Psh, I got this. Okay, so you're going to con conduct a cross. A blood type A woman has children with type AB man. What blood types could their children have? Okay, so go back to the slide that we had before. All right, and see, what do the genotypes have to be in order to have those blood types? Well, we know that blood type AB is only blood type AB, but what about blood type A? Okay, go back and think about that. Take a moment, think about that information, and work through all the questions. Work through all the ones, I'm sorry, work through all the answers, and pick the one that you feel is correct. Now, if you worked through everything and it went well, you should have chosen E, okay? So the man is AB, which means the kids are not going to be type A only. The woman is blood type A, which means that um, it's not like you can only have B kids, okay? And additionally, it's not that you can only have AB, all right? But if you work through it, so if the woman, let's say, is AO and her husband is AB, you could technically have A, AB, or B, okay? Because they didn't tell you what was going on in the next generation, you have to assume she could be AA or AO, okay? So that's why E is correct. Okay, so let's tweak this a bit. All right, so same question, but it tells you she's homozygous for the blood type allele, and she's A. Remember I've told you before, in science, details are everything. I'm trying to train you for this now because 172 is going to do the same thing, okay? So that means she's AA. If she marries a man and has children with him with AB, what is the answer going to be? If you work through it and everything went well, D should be the correct answer, and it should make sense. If not, and it doesn't make sense, or you're not sure of something, please let me know, okay? So I am going to be on, well, I should, probably should have said this earlier, but from 2 to 4 on Wednesday, um, I will be on the uh, chat. And if you guys need more help, though, than the chat can offer, um, the other choice we can do is I could definitely and happily set up a Zoom appointment with you because it's way more fun if I'm talking to a real person anyway, but I'm there if you need if you have questions, okay? Okay, one more practice problem on this, okay? Once again, we see a word problem, and we take a deep breath, and we relax. <sighs> okay, you guys have got this. So, unicorns can have red, wing, red, white, or pink hair. Two of them had children, one with pink and one with white. The pink unicorns' brothers and sisters, guys, not children, the brothers and sisters were all pink-haired as well. That's important. Offspring of the mating of the pink and the white turned out to be 50-50. So, the question is, what are the possible phenotypes of the pink unicorn's parents? Okay? Now, I've told you this before. It's a hobby of mine to help you guys improve grades in not just this one, but all your classes. And part of that means learning how to read exam questions. Okay? So, in order for you to choose something based on this, everything has to be true. Okay? So, if the hair color is incompletely dominant, that's a possibility. If the hair color is completely dominant, doesn't seem like it. If the hair color is co-dominant, also doesn't seem like it. Cross that one out. If the hair color is completely dominant, cross that one out because then you wouldn't have pink. Okay? So then you're going between A and B. Well, we said completely dominant. So that should instantly take you to A. So we know that the first part of A is correct. Read to make sure the second part of A is correct. The pink unicorn's parents would have had to be red-haired and white-haired, okay? Therefore, to address this question, the correct answer has to be A. So in order for you to choose it, it all has to be true. Do not be tricked, 
by questions like this. And don't panic. Just read them, figure out what part of it's right and what part's going on. Make sure you understand it and feel comfortable with it. All right, guys, so let's talk pedigrees. Okay, so pedigrees are incredibly useful because they let you figure out how a disease inherits, is inherited, if it's dominant or recessive, and you work it through the different generations. The way you read a pedigree is that males are squares and females are circles. Okay, so if they have been filled in, that means they're affected, so they have the disease. A horizontal line in between individuals means that they got married and had kids. Well, I can, uh, you know what I mean, they had kids. <laughs> okay, so um, progeny are arranged horizontally left to right in order of birth. And a double line means mating between relatives. Yes, I know you. Okay, and you can also have identical twins or non-identical twins shown as above. Okay, so... You should be able to look at this and interpret the pedigree and be able to figure out a little bit about the disease that they're talking about. So I might have gotten a little overzealous with the happy faces. <laughs> the only thing that this slide really adds is to talk about the progeny going from, you know, uh, left to right. Other than that, it's basically what I said just a few seconds ago. Okay, so let's look at this. How is the disease inherited? Okay, so look at the individuals who are afflicted. Then look at what happens with their offspring. Okay, if it's dominant, then if they have the gene for it in the heterozygote, it should be expressed. Is that what you see? By the way, it's not C. Now, if you work through this and things went well, you should be able to see that, in fact, it's recessive. Okay, because remember, if it was dominant, then any child that had that is going to, you know, or any individual that had that is likely going to have a kid that expresses it as well because it's dominant. But in this situation, nobody had it, okay? Not only that, you know that the parents that had the double line that were related um, were heterozygotes, but they don't express the disease, but their kid did, okay? So that tells you that this disease is recessive. A nice way to test yourself is to show what the offspring would be had, or the parents would be had it been dominant, okay? That's really good practice. All right, let's talk about maternal inheritance, okay? Um, and then I think this is going to be the last portion, you know, like section of lecture um, in lecture five. But don't forget, lecture six is going to be um, completed and uploaded as well. Now, we've talked about the mitochondria before. We've said that it's the powerhouse of the cell. We said because of the endosymbiotic theory, um, it was initially thought the mitochondria was a, you know, independent bacteria that could you know, go through the process of respiration to, pro or to produce um, energy to get ATP. And, you know, we've talked about all the reasons why it was thought that it was an independent bacteria. Well, some no another fun fact that you may not realize about mitochondria is it is strictly maternally inherited. So your mitochondria came from your mom, and your mom's came from her mom, okay? So the mitochondria is always maternally inherited, which means that, you know, comes from mom. Again, just to reinforce, the mitochondria have their own genome. It's separate from the nucleus. They're maternally inherited in humans. Um, in some plants, most plants, by the way, the chloroplasts tend to be maternally inherited. However, in the conifers, they're paternal through the pollen. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, you might be asking yourself, well, why is this the case? Why would you only have something from your mom? Well, if we think, now this is a hypothesis, keep in mind, but it's a relatively interesting one. So if we think about this, Okay, um, most of the time when you have differences between cells or differences between genes or something along those lines, a lot of times they compete, okay? And the hypothesis is if you had mitochondria from mom and mitochondria from dad, they might start competing against one another to make more copies of themselves, which may not be the best thing for the critter or us is what I'm saying. In which case, that could be harmful to the creature and that would be selected out, Okay, so that's why the organelles are always uni uniparentally inherited, and hopefully that makes sense. Now, you can still think about pedigrees and figuring out who might have it, um, you know, if you have a disease that's carried only through the mitochondria. So remember, um, everybody gets their mitochondria from mom, okay, in which case, knowing this, by the way, follow this pedigree through, this should all make sense. You should also know why all of those offspring do not have the genetic disease. Okay? If that doesn't make sense, let me know. Think about it, though. 
All right, why are those offspring unaffected? You should know this. Okay, so look, practice problem, yay. Time to work through them again. Pedigree of a family in which all the individuals in generation two died. Oh goodness, that is depressing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> During a natural disaster, remember this is an example. Okay. Which children in generation three could establish their descendants of the grandmother in this pedigree by using only mitochondrial DNA? All right, so work through this and figure out which ones could determine, you know, A, B, C, D, or E would be able to determine if their grandmother, okay, if they're descendants of that grandmother. Okay, so if everything went well, this was your answer, A, B, and C, okay? So remember, you're only tracing through mom, in which case, of that grandmother, D and E was the dad, so they're not going to have that mitochondria. Okay, so A, B, and C should be your correct answer. Now, if you will recall, we have mentioned the endosymbiotic theory as the origin for mitochondria and chloroplast, okay? And so if you happen to be curious, mitochondria are phylogenetically more closely related to the bacteria Rickettsia proaski. Okay, um, just fun fact, trivia. I always think we should have a trivia game of biology, but no one ever takes me up on it. Maybe I should start getting out more. <laughs> All right, everyone, so we also know that the chloroplasts were originally um, also through endosymbiotic bacteria, uh, cyanobacteria, okay? And then they just spread because those who could photosynthesize could make their own food. Think of how great that would be. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So I hope this lecture makes sense. All right. And when you're ready, stop and take a break. Go through and make sure, you know, everything looks right. If you have questions, let me know. I am going to work on and upload the next lecture for Wednesday. As I said, you guys are paying a fortune for this education. I want to make sure you're getting your money's worth.